I'm April of Permaculture Visions. In this video tutorial, I'm going to share with you how we can move water across the landscape without pipes or hoses, just using gravity. Now this topic is a little bit complicated, so grab a mug of something comforting and let's dive in. Regardless of whether you are building a swale or an irrigation channel, you need to measure the contours. To remind you of what contours are, here is a classic landscape of paddy fields in an area with high rainfall. Each paddy, each field, has a contoured space that is flat. The rainwater is held on these paddies and it doesn't run away unless the paddy overfills. Then it runs down to the next paddy. This landscape looks pretty, but please don't be tempted to copy it. You can see the river is brown because it contains precious soil from over clearing. Making an irrigation channel on Rowena's site involved precise calculation. Rowena made an A-frame and she's marking the ground as she walks this along. First use. Once we had the contours marked, oh, they used we did the calculations the for the irrigation oh, channel to run 15 degrees off the contour. And I will show you how to do this. But first, it's a good practice to get a feel for the slope and have a visual estimation of what you think each contour line should look like. Rowena explains this and how she felt that it hugged the landscape. Well, I've just gotten down low closer to the, the ground so that I can visualise. I'm visualising the slope of the land and where the water is running and perhaps where we could catch, capture it. Yeah, and it just feels like it's wrapping around um, at the base of a hill. In a previous video, I showed you the difference between a trench, a ditch, a berm and a swale. Now a swale is a kind of a ditch that sits perfectly on the contour. It acts as a narrow temporary dam. It catches water and it allows it to seep through the soil rather than continuing to let the water run along the surface. On the other hand, a key line irrigation channel look, can look almost the same, but it's used to move the water slowly out from the wetter areas to the drier areas. So the swale's a trench, a bit like a long bucket with holes in it. We don't have any plastic lining in it. We need to be really precise because the swale sits level on the contour. It catches the water and it allows it to seep through, through the soil. You can see here where we've dug a swale. Well, when I say we, I mean mostly the rest of the team. We've dug a swale and then we put water in it because they started before I got there and I needed to test whether this was actually going to work. So we put water in it and you can see that it's pretty level and the water is not escaping. It's not even moving. Once we've filled it up, it just seeps through. But I would need to keep an eye on the system, especially during high periods of rainfall. It's a good time to go out there and have a look and check for any leakage points. Digging a channel requires a little bit more preparation you don't just mark the contours, but you need to do the mathematics and mark a fall from that contour. I'll show you how to do that. But the good news after you've done that extra bit of preparation is that it is a bit more self-cleaning because as the water moves along, it washes out loose debris. With swales, we can hold the water, but with channels, we can actually move water from gullies, wet gullies, to dry ridges. This is a small part of the key line irrigation method that was pioneered by Yeoman Senior during the 1950s. His method has rehabilitated many large farms around the world. Sadly, I didn't have to search far on Google Maps to find a patch of denuded and eroding land to use as an example for this tutorial. If you are interested in how I would heal the landscape, it's complex, but I'll present that at the end of the video. Actually, there are two ways to use gravity to move water across the landscape. The easiest way to get water to move from one place to another is to dig through every mound that is in the way. But the long-term problem with digging deeper and deeper as you go is that it will eventually block up because when the water is still, it will drop silt. Sometimes you just have to dig deeper till the water will get to where you need it to get to. You can see Grant redigging the swales here at Gilly's Kitchen Garden in Otford. We had found an area of the garden that was always dry, 
and I discovered that the wet area was also leaking water into the gardens below. So we had to redig the swale to make it level. What are you doing, Grant? I am digging all out of the swale. Yeah. Because it's currently blocked or it's yeah. not level and it's going out. The Coming the wrong way. We plugged this end up. Yes, so that the water moves. No. This way. Great. Go down. You think you'll make it to the end or are you just way off contour? Are you having to go deeper? It's trickling every time I scoop it out, it's falling in. Great. If it got blocked now, is to make it deeper, right? Deeper. Yeah. We used water from the rainwater tank through a hose to show us the level. That's a bit costly in terms of wasting water, but it was worth splashing out. Grant had, a, had, Grant had to dig deeper and deeper until the water got to the end of the trench. But his hard work also served to separate the grassed path from the garden bed. This trench will silt up over time because it's now on the contour. So the long-term plan is to allow the garden bed to be reshaped, to allow it to slip down gently off the contour, falling away at 15 degrees off contour. However, you can see here that once we have planted trees and other deep rooted plants, changing the bed angle becomes quite tricky. So the second method of moving water from one point to another is the off contour irrigation channel. And my favorite reason for digging an irrigation channel is you don't have to dig as deeply, so you don't need to do as much digging. So let's get into the mathematics. Imagine you've walked across the slope of a hill. When you walk across the contour, one foot is slightly lower than the other, but we're feeling pretty balanced. Whereas when you walk uphill, you can feel pressure in the heel of your boots. And when you walk downhill, you'll feel pressure on the soles of your feet. When we drop downhill by one meter in height for every meter that we've gone across the slope, we're walking down a steep path. Most landscape standards will call this a slippery slope and you would be advised to install retaining walls and steps to stop people from falling. Now let's imagine you're walking across the fields. You're going downhill as you walk, but you're also walking across. And if you go down only two thirds of a meter instead of the whole meter, it's still quite a steep path, but by landscaping standards, it doesn't require steps or a retaining wall. That's called the one third drop. It's 30 degrees. We all know that the easiest way to get down a hill in a very open space is to go down slightly downhill as we travel across. Now imagine you drop by only a third of a meter or yard for every meter that you walk across. This gets us the magical 15 degrees off contour. It's a gentle slope and it's sufficient to enable rainwater to travel along without causing erosion. If you find that there are trees or rocks in your way, you might need to do a combination of deeper digging and going off contour. Grant and Tim have now developed a productive kitchen garden using natural irrigation technique. As promised, I'm going to share with you now how I would heal that patch of Big Hill. The property is now called Big Hill, but the Gandangara people were the original custodians of the area, and they were dispossessed early in Australia's colonial history in the late 1790s. I know this property is denuded because there's national parkland and forested areas all around this area. Here is the wider landscape. I chose a site that is near Big Hill, and you can see the contrast between farming lands and rich dark green of the Talo River National Park. So the general area is able to be rehabilitated. It's recoverable. It gets cool wind to wind. The elevation is at 658 meters, but there are only about 40 people who live in the area. This tells me that whatever strategy we need to use needs to not need constant monitoring and fixing. So electric fencing is not a good option because you need to check it regularly for debris that blows onto it. 
and with most hills it's probably windy. Also from the aerial shots we can see that this area is farmed because it has a dam constructed at the head of gully 3, one at the head of gully 1 and possibly one we can't see at the head of gully 2. And I know that there are hard hooved animals using this site because there are squiggly tracks. Those squiggly tracks are made by hard hooved domestic animals because the native animals in this area don't have hard hooves. I'm talking about kangaroos. But there are feral animals such as deer that have hard hooves. The erosion in Gully One probably started with an old fence. I can see the remnants of a fence line. The erosion will only get worse over time because the water will run faster as the gully gets deeper. So first up, I would use metal baskets containing rubble or rocks to create leaky weirs in the gullies. I would start at the top because we can slow water down bit by bit. I would do all of that leaky weir blockages before installing any fencing. If I don't have funds for metal baskets, I could use scrap wood and any metal that is lying around. The next thing I would do is start excluding as many hard hooved animals as I can. I would sell off the domestic animals and start supporting native animals. I would also need to contend with the feral deer, foxes, wild dogs and large feral cats. You can do this with fencing, but that can also become a source of erosion. I've put a red line in where the traces of the old fence are. Another option might be LED lights that scare away the animals. Before I consider installing any fencing, I would do the earthworks to direct water from the wet gullies to the dry ridges. I would put in the irrigation channels. I would then start planting out in the spillage below the irrigation channels where I've dug out the soil. That spillage would be perfect for planting into. And I would cover that area, the spilt soil, because it's quite delicate. I would cover that with branches of native bushes. Ideally, the native bush branches I would get would be sourced from nearby and would have some seed pods on them. Then I would install a fence and inside the fence line, I would plant native fodder trees so that animals can eat from them, but not destroy them. This would be handy up high because the manure from these animals would help fertilize the area. Finally, I would also add seed bombs to revegetate the area. All these strategies I would tailor to suit the microclimate, the soil type, plant species and the risk of vandalism. But on the whole, giving nature a chance to repair is never a bad strategy.